to be a moral and an ethical problem that we solve. Following the money will be where this is. We have the solutions. Renewables are cheaper. Um, the business case for change is stronger than ever. So it's really about finding, well, we have the will. The question to our leaders is, do you have the courage to follow through with that um, and to lead on climate? So um, I've just realized that um, everyone, we've been standing for a while. So if anybody would like to sit down, please feel free. But I'm just going to do a bit of an energizer again. So if I could get everyone to raise your hands and say, rise for climate. Rise for climate. Right, and if anybody wants to jump up and down to get the blood flowing as well, move your legs, move your toes, go for it, um, have a seat. Um, we've just got a couple more speakers and then we're going to move to the front of the tape for a photo opportunity. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce Tim Crossland, the director of Plan B. Thank you, Tim. He's got his bumpton. Thank you, Tanya. Um, so yes, I'm Tim from Plan B. We're a charity that's suing the UK government for failing to align its climate targets to science. And to the international agreement it advanced, signed and ratified. And we're suing the UK government for its insane plans to expand Heathrow Airport. So I'm delighted that we're coming together today to rise for climate. And when I say we, I don't just mean the we opposite St Paul's Cathedral. I mean the we from Bogota to Paris, from Accra to New Delhi, and from Manila to Alice Springs. The we who join hands to stand up for our future, to stand up for our children's future, and to stand up for the future for life on Earth. But let's be honest with ourselves and let's compare ourselves to our politicians who every year since 1994 have come together to consider the urgent, grave threats from climate change, to sign documents, to perform photo shoots, to congratulate themselves. And every year since then, emissions of greenhouse gases have risen and have risen at the highest rate ever and rose again in 2017. Shame! Shame! So let's make sure we don't take a leaf out of their book. If real climate leadership rises from the grassroots up, we must do more than symbolic gestures that make us feel good. We must commit to real climate leadership, which means honesty about the scale and urgency of the threat. It means honesty about the scale and radical nature of the solutions that are now required. And it means each and every one of us taking a profound personal commitment to do whatever it takes, whatever we can. Before 2015, there was a political commitment to warming, limiting warming to two degrees. And then a really quite extraordinary thing happened in December 2015. Despite the obvious political, economic difficulty of doing that, of limiting warming to two degrees, every government in the world, including Saudi Arabia, including Russia, including the US, said two degrees is not enough, it's inadequate, it's dangerous. We've got to do better. We've got to limit warming to well below two degrees, to 1.5 degrees. How did that extraordinary thing happen? It happened because the science was so clear. What the science tells us is beyond 1.5 degrees, the risk of crossing critical tipping points in the climate system rise sharply. 
and as we approach two degrees, those risks become intolerable. And if that sounds a little bit abstract, just a couple of concrete examples. As the sea ice melts, ice reflects heat away from the Earth. It's replaced by dark water, which absorbs heat. So more ice melts and the process speeds up. As permafrost melts, methane is released, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. The Amazon rainforest evolved in conditions of constant humidity, so the trees have no evolved resistance to fire. As temperatures warm, the first spark takes it all down. The world's largest land-based carbon sink releases all of that carbon life into the atmosphere. So we need to be honest and understand that climate change is not a slow, linear progression. We're up against a cliff edge and we're close to it. What the IPCC tells us is that at present rates, we're going to cross that 1.5 threshold in 2040. For children born today, that's around the time they're leaving school or university. That is being honest about where we are. And any solutions that don't match that urgency, they're false solutions. And let's not fool ourselves. We're not going to do this just by recycling or even ordinary recycling. Those things are essential, they're ethical, they're important, but it's not enough. So what do we need to happen? This is on a different scale to changing consumer and lifestyle choices. But if we're waiting for politicians to start thinking beyond the next headline, beyond the next election, if we're waiting for CEOs to think beyond their bottom line, we shouldn't hold our breath. One of the features of our times is that ideas spread fast. A disgraced film mogul and a hashtag spark cultural revolution. People might have said, Hollywood, it has always been this way, it will forever be that way. Things have changed and my God, they've changed fast. An episode of David Attenborough changes our relationship to plastic forever. In 2011, Western commentators were looking at the Arab Spring and saying, here we have the zenith of democracy. Just five years later, we're at its nadir. So somehow we must harness this mercurial energy of our times, because if we can do that, and we harness it to a unifying agenda which everybody can get behind. Life for ourselves, for our children, for our planet. Who can sensibly disagree with that? We'll be okay. It's the cultural change that drives political change. We can get to a point where within two years, nobody's going to be voted in if they don't take this seriously because it just seems too crazy. We can get to a point within a couple of years where the leaders of the G20 accept we're in the middle of an emergency, we're in the middle of a crisis, the enemy is at the gate, and we must unite to do everything that we can to command our economies to meet that threat. If that happens, we will be okay. So being practical, what can we do? What do we need to do? First, and most importantly, we need to make sure that as many people as possible have accurate, accessible information. We've had decades of misinformation promulgated by vested interests. Lies after lies. Fossil fuel companies that in the 80s were building their oil rigs higher in the ocean because their research was telling them about sea level rises, while telling the rest of the world there was nothing to worry about. It set us back. The general public remains confused and that makes it hard for political leaders to do what they know needs to be done. That has to change. 
We need a leaflet going through the door of everybody in the country. Climate change, you and your family. What does this mean? When people understand that, they'll want their leaders to take action. Second, we need to build this political movement, not just today, but every day. Time is short, there is no time to lose. So in our schools, in our universities, in our communities, we've got to build the movement around clear and focused demands. And third, where that doesn't work, we must take persistent, determined, legal action through the courts. Because this may happen slowly, the path to justice isn't always easy, as people say, sometimes justice is just us. But in a few years, we can get to the point where it seems crazy to imagine that people could ever have thought it was legal to do things, knowing that those things tend to the destruction of everything in life that is possibly worth caring about. How can that be lawful? How can it be rational? This movement of legal action is growing fast around the world. Two years ago, there was just one case in the Netherlands, and the Dutch court says this very simple thing. Um, climate change is a threat to the life of everybody in this country. Clearly, there is a duty on government to take reasonable, necessary measures to safeguard against that threat. There are now similar legal actions in Uganda, in Belgium, in the US, in Paris. And what was niche is now mainstream. The mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, is suing the fossil fuel companies, saying you must pay the price for the wall around Wall Street. We need to keep the surge waters at bay. Arnie Schwarzenegger, the Republican, the one-time Terminator, he came out earlier this year and said, I am going to sue the fossil fuel companies for first-degree murder. They knew what the consequence of this was going to be. So the tide is changing. And we all get behind this. We can make this a day to remember. We can get to the point where every politician, every CEO in the country understands that their future is our future and our future is theirs. Thank you. Their future is our future. Very sage words from Tim Crossman, everybody. Um, how are we doing? I'm sorry for you.